Okay, so let's get down to business. We've over 100 people on the call. John McGrath is my name. Uh, the discussion this evening, which is part of our MSc in project management, we've opened it up to the wider PM community in Ireland and around the globe, is the fascinating subject of project control. So this is certainly an emerging discipline. Um, and I suppose the first thing we're going to start off with, just a very quick introduction of who's here. We've one hour to do this. We'll keep it really uh, swift. So in terms of our panel, we have Mark Kennedy, who's head of project controls with Sanofi, Alan Duffy, who's head of project controls at the DAA, Fiona Gaynor, who's a project control surveyor at Kirby Engineering, JP Hillard, who's a director at WKN Real Estate, and Paul Reese, who's head of client services at Core Systems. So massive amount of experience. And I suppose if you want to jump in and, and pop questions in the panel, that will be great. We'll try and get through to them as much as possible. But I think the first thing we should kick off with, guys, is an understanding in the real world, what is the difference between project controls and project management? Are they complementary or are they adversarial? And in terms of your own real world experience, how would you define the difference? Would anyone like to jump in and take that? Okay, maybe I'll jump in just to kick things off, John. Um, in my own view, project controls is, is unfortunately almost lost within the, the overall realm of project management. Um, it, it's such a significant area in terms of um, cost control, program control, change management. Um, I think the term is, is almost unfortunate. Um, and I think that the importance of project controls um, is almost lost within the overall um, team of project management. So I think in a way um, it, it should almost sit out on its own. Um, and I think, you know, even in terms of the level of competency of project managers per se um, to actually execute really good and efficient project controls um, it is there's a quite a wide spectrum um, in, in the marketplace so um, I think it's 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 a hugely important topic but I think unfortunately it's lost somewhat within the overall um, sort of gambit of project management, certainly in my experience. But is that because it's not understood or is that because it's almost deemed to be a junior role? So I see often that the they're looking for a project controls and so very often, I know we've got some very experienced senior people on the call, but I think my own observation would, when you look at a lot of jobs, it's seen to be a junior role and maybe even a step before you become a project manager. Uh, and mm. I think I'm sure the panel would make the view that you probably need to have several years of project management in order to actually take on the project controls role. That's a, a kind of a topical one or one we could debate. But anyone yeah, else? It, it, if I may, I would describe, and I've often said it to people that work for me and that I, I have worked for, project controls sometimes acts as a conscience towards the project manager themselves. Well, the, the buck stops with a project manager and accountability. A strong project controls member of the team would understand all aspects of cost, scope, risk, and schedule. So it's not just one, one area as such. A true project controls person would understand pretty much everything about the project as you go because you're there from generally from the very beginning right the way through to the end in project handover. So they're involved in everything. And what I say the conscience of a project manager is very simple is that often when there's decisions to be made around cost or schedule that the project manager would go to the project controls as a sounding board to understand what the implications are for having, can I approve a change order? Can I make decisions on schedule? What is the implication of risks? And bring those back into the, an informed decision that's there. It sounds, yeah. a little, it sounds a little bit like the solicitor and the barrister before court deciding on a strategy of action. Is that the, are they two dis different disciplines that complement the client? So is that what you would think, Mark? Yeah, absolutely. They do complement one another because, um, you know, everything on a project is a partnership. And while the buck stops with the project manager, he's accountable for the delivery of the works. Everyone has their part to play and... Certainly a strong project controls individual is key to that because they bring a certain perspective 
on, uh, as I said, those four key areas on scope, cost, schedule, and the risk. And, and they, have, they have a good view on all of those. And that's uh, <clears throat> where we work within and where particularly I work within the, the life science over the last 32 years, looking at project controls, construction, and so on. So you, you, you've moved over from today to represent the, the client. Are, are, you, are you gamekeeper turned poacher? Is that the... Absolutely. Okay. Tell us a little bit about that in the different roles when you're now representing the client as opposed to a contractor. So... Effective on things many moons ago. Oh, see some PM folks on the line. Um, and I've worked for construction firms like CISC, uh, Radley's, and so on. But what it's given me is a certain perspective of what the engineering firms want to deliver, what the expectations are around uh, contractors and the frustrations that they have in lack of decision making by owners. And then what the owner expectation is around the costs and the challenges that they face. So it it is poacher turn gamekeeper, but it's given me a broad perspective on everyone's needs throughout the, the full project. Okay, so just uh, the so we the questions are starting to come in the chat, which is great. And uh, but in terms of the hundred and thirteen people on the call, please do ask questions. The goal here isn't for my questions to be answered; it's for your questions to be answered. So just there is certainly I'm seeing some comments here. They do see them as complimentary. Uh, I, the, the one item I would pick up listening to you is I think we know they're complimentary, but we full still haven't fully understand exactly how they gel together. They're, they're complimentary. But I think that in terms of that sort of perfect interlocking, I certainly think project controls and, and PM uh, is on a journey to, to advance in that space. In terms, I'll take this question from, from Royce as an open question to the panel. So I'll just read out the question and I'll paraphrase it just to make sure we all understand it. So Roy's question, how does the panel see the relationship between project controls and the PMO, uh, particularly when the PMO is operating in a QA role? So that's an interesting one in terms of the project controls and how it interacts with the PMO. And I suppose the question is being asked there, is it different to a project manager? interacting with the PMO and how does that sit in terms of quality assurance? So it's almost two questions in that, if anyone would like to try and take part of this. So I can only speak for, in my world, the, pre, the PMO or the project management office, we would have a variation of that for PPD, which is the project's portfolio department. What, what they would look at in my world and in, in how we do things is to understand the availability of resources and the timing of particular projects as they're executed within our portfolio today. Whereas the project manager that's there for us is one to execute those projects then based upon the decision to move forward. Um, that, that's how we would actually manage our, our items and how we use PMO project portfolio department that's there. Okay. Yeah, I'd, I'd just, uh, just add to that as well. Um, you know, certainly from the, the, you know, the clients that we're working with, the, the PMO are, are almost the ones that are sort of defining those, those KPIs and, and, and the operating um, sort of model uh, at which, you know, against which I suppose that the project controls teams are, are actually operating. So uh, yeah, I, I think, um, I'd, I'd agree with that. Okay, anyone else got uh, an opinion on that in terms of how a project controls would interact with a PMO? Is it different to how project managers from a controls versus PM? Um, John, Pat Davis here. Um, I think that historically, certainly from my experience, um, a great distinction in the areas that I work in, a great distinction has never been made between project controls and project management. And it is usually all wrapped up in a single bundle for the project manager to, to manage. And I think that what you're hopefully getting at today will be uh, to show the clear distinction between project controls and project management and uh, the, different, um, the different inputs and outputs that are required for both. 
Yeah, I think just in a discussion I had previous with the, with the participants, what, what, what I thought was very interesting, which kind of comes from that, and Mark has mentioned, um, you know, schedule, cost, uh, uh, scope, but there are also a range of software skills that are part of project controls as well around the whole area of, I think, uh, uh, conflict resolution, uh, you know, working towards solutions. So I do think that in our maturity of our understanding of project controls, it's not just the hard skills that we need uh, you know, somebody working in a project controls, I think they need the software skills as well. Any of your own thoughts on that, guys? You've all talked about the, in terms of our panelists, you've talked about the harder skills. But where do the soft skills come into project controls? Yeah, I suppose, well, look, from my point, um, <clears throat> I would tend to agree with the guys in that, look, at project controls can be seen as a subset of project management. Um, now, in our organisation, we try to deal with that by, we have our QSs, we have our schedulers and our risk team in each program of work. But outside of that, what we do is we have within, I suppose, our PMO or within our, um, I suppose, management line, we have project controls and all the different disciplines. And there's a broken line back into each of the programs so that, as Chris said, the project controls lead can act as the conscience and can have the voice and the power to say, you know, this is what we need to do. This is the advice I need to give you. So from my, just to go back to that, that's where I would see it, you do need a really good uh, project controls lead in any project or any program to act as that conscience. But I think on the softer skills, I suppose project controllers nowadays do really need to be getting into the area where um, we're talking about, you know, full interface of our systems or full integration of our systems, sorry. So we operate where we have P6 for our scheduling, we have Unifier for our cost management, we have ARM and our risk management, we use um, um, CMR for our um, contract management. And they're all of those tools, they're really, really useful, but it's very, very hard to get the project management side of the house fully involved in those without, I suppose, having that integration across the uh, piece. So one of the big things that we push our people to do is to help develop that integration across the different systems. Whereas it's not seen as anything, I suppose, a, a core skill where you know, you're developing a schedule or anything like that, but building up that knowledge to understand from an IT perspective, how you can help improve the project. Okay, very good. So just just taking a look. So just, just I am watching the chat guys. So if you could, uh, maybe phrase a question at the end of your comment would be would be great it just gives us a bit of structure just a couple of questions from comments from pat there so pat has talked about that controls are very much predetermined and necessary to, uh, to monitor to ensure limits not breached and certainly i do think that is that is the view but i think that is perhaps a traditional view and that's getting more complex you know that project controls is more than that in the modern era certainly that's a traditional one i look at the next question here um, is there quite a large a, a, a flicker on the screen, guys, or is it just mine? Do you mind me asking? No, just yours. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so the in it, so the question here, which is coming from Paul Paul Gill this time. So project controls lies with the governance of the project, and therefore with with the PM and my organisation. In regards to tracking metrics and project success, I think it needs to lie with the PM. Otherwise, it becomes very muddy. So. That's a slightly different view here where we've seen uh, Pat previously talk about it metrics driven, whereby Paul here still thinks the control for the metrics should be sitting with the with the PM. Any thoughts on that, guys? Well, it, it so as I said at the very start is the accountability for delivery with, of the project lies solely with the project manager or project director. Um, but at the end of the day, all of the KPIs which you develop are formulated and compiled typically with um, project controls. Now, clearly it depends on the scale of the project. If you're talking about a relatively small project, then the project manager or someone could handle that or a project engineer could handle that quite comfortably. But if you have a project, project that's 50 million, 100 million, and a lot of moving parts and a lot of inputs coming into it, there's a very simple rule insofar as if the project manager is down in the trenches looking at the work or involved in the weeds on a daily basis, then you can't see the things that are going on around you. So you have to rely on the team and the project controls is enabled to give you those metrics to be able to tell you from either earned value, 
your cost performance, your commitment, your spend, your forecast to complete, um, change management, all of those things. As I say, so, you know, absolutely the book stops with the PM, that there's never a question around that, but there's, there's certain levels of projects where you have to ensure that all of those KPIs and other metrics are, are being looked after by somebody else and fed in at a regular cadence to the project, typically bi-weekly for our value or whatever is needed on a monthly basis to make sure you're on track. Otherwise you lose control and the word is project controls. Just okay. to add so, to that, yeah. sorry, so sorry, John, just, go ahead, yeah. just to add to that, Mark, um, based on a lot of projects that, that we work on over the last X number of years, you know, they might be a commercial office block of 50 million or they might be a residential scheme of 80 or 90 million. Uh, we find a major issue is that the reality on the ground is that your, your fee will not cover you to employ a project control specialist, yet the client may well demand that and the project may demand that. So then you're left in a situation where the project manager on the project or the project director really has to have a good skill set to actually enact good project controls themselves. Um, and, and that's a real challenge in the marketplace. And unless you're looking at a, a major project like Capital Dock or, or a project of that scale, it's very unlikely that you'll have within your fee um, the cost uh, to employ a project control specialist, yet the project will demand that. So there's yeah. a bit of a dichotomy there. I, there is, and that's that's one of the challenges that people face in so far as there's always a desire to keep down your preliminary costs, um, and it, the owner or client will challenge those um, as you go on. However, a, a good project controls person will be able to keep track of the schedule for you. If you're if you're in a claim situation. You want to be able to go back and look at the documentation, look at the records, keep track of the schedules and everything else that's there. And, you know, project controls can pay for itself yeah. over time. They, they actually, we can, right? There's, mm -hmm. there's some metrics that are out there which will show that. Now, clearly, you don't want to be in that place. But I tell you, if you are, you want to be able to draw upon it and mm -hmm. use the information and have those records that strong project controls people can deliver. But totally understand uh, a PM in that situation having to do project controls. Um, but th the core skill of project controls itself hasn't gone away. It's just transferred ownership and the poor PM is going to have to buy himself in two. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, and Mark, just sort of picking up on, on something there that, that actually Alan said as well, that, I mean, the... the the, the risk sometimes of project controls is, is that it's, it's almost very siloed in the way that it's working. You know, again, as you say, there's a, there's a schedule piece, there's a, there's a cost piece, there's a risk piece. Uh, so without that sort of integration layer, um, which, which is probably somewhere between project management and project control, uh, you know, the, the, the risk is that, that you know, if you are in a claim situation, etc., that in the end you you end up having to interrogate interrogate three or four or, or multiple sort of systems. So, so I, I suppose for me, one of the one of the important things for project controls is is that underpinning. Uh, you know, not just the people, but you know, with with actually process and with technology as well. Okay, just a point to have to just uh, if anyone has ever studied project management, you mentioned the, the, the dreaded earn value management, Mark. So, so I suppose a, we can't let you all away without, uh, is it done in practice or have we been hoodwinked all along? So tell us the real <laughs> deal with earn value management, cut to the chase. Any of the panel? And look, just from our point um, in the DAA, uh, we aspire, but we haven't yet got there with regard to earn value management. There are a lot of challenges for us to try to get there because we rely solely on the data that comes from our contractors and to, to, to get that data that I suppose be any integrity or that you could trust that data because um, they're building the schedules. And look, at, I'm not saying they're building the schedules in a way that suits them, but they should build a schedule in the way that suits them. They should cash flow a schedule that suits them. For earned value to work, you need real, real accuracy on actual costs. And I know Mark will, will, will most likely kick back on this, but for us to get real, real detail on actual costs, it's difficult. So unless we employ a lot more schedulers and a lot more QSs, we, 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 we're not in a position to 
really work on earned value, maybe yeah. on mega projects it might yeah. happen. My politically correct answer to that, Alan, when I'm asked, I say, I say we use earned value light. Light, well, enough. very light, yeah. <laughs> that's, uh, that's my way of getting around it. But I think that's a very honest, and I think that in terms of earned value management, yes, I mean, it, it's, it's a great theory, but the issue is you need to have a plan cost for every single component in the WBS, which just isn't realistic, because the nature of projects is we don't have crystal balls to predict every single line item on a Gantt chart for the next four years or whatever it's mm -hmm. going to be. I'm going to give yeah. you a hard, a hard time, Paul. You're, you, you're supposed to be building these tools that's supposed to allow us to calculate earned value management. Does it work or not in your tool? Uh, it, well, yeah, speaking from a, from a technology perspective, yes, the, uh, the, functionality, uh, the functionality works fine. The, uh, the challenge is the maturity, typically, of the organizations and the processes. And, uh, and, and again, really for, for us from a, from a technology perspective, it's it, what we do is underpin work practices. Uh, we, you know, we, 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 don't, we don't provide the, the overall solution. You know, okay. that, and as you say, I think, you know, not, not having that, that, uh, that fully cost loaded schedule, et cetera, you know, the very few organizations are in that, are in that maturity. Yeah, I think anyone else comment on the earned value? I want to come back to the maturity because I think that's a key key component of project controls is the maturity in an organization. But just mm. to hear from anyone else in the panel in terms of, and by the way, we'd love to hear in the comments if there are examples where organizations have su successfully deployed earned value management uh, in, in the Irish or in the internet, international context. We'd love to hear it in the chat. But just to our panelists, any of you using... John, I've, I've used this. I used it about 12 years ago in the Middle East um, and to, to, to support Alan's comments there. Um, I was working for a main contractor at the time. Uh, there may well be one or two people on the call here who, who know who I'm talking about. But suffice to say, we had to report on earned value analysis uh, using Primavera. Um, and um, like it or not, uh, it was quite easy to manipulate. Um, and it was quite easy to, uh, you know, let the clients know where we felt we stood on program. The reality was a little bit different. So I would have a little bit of a <laughs> um, shaded view of earned value analysis. Uh, yeah. in the real and was world. that at the project level? Uh, was that at the project uh, on an individual project, JP, was it? No, that, that was across portfolio of five projects uh, as part of a program. So okay. um, look, that was the reality on the ground, was what it was. Yeah. Just, just to add there, JP, it was probably tracking our field QSs on every project. So the contractor had great insight to their actual install as well. Compared to, say, Ireland, where you, you don't have projects with tracking or field QSs across the, the board. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Okay. But the, so I, I have a slightly different view in, in it. And I, I understand, like, talking about earn value, that sometimes it can be this mysterious thing that is a monster to, to create. It's a monster to update. Um, but the reality is when you're working with uh, various engineering firms and doing schedules, I've often seen the case where a schedule is done and we're looking at the schedule and all we see is a colored bar as the timeline moves from right to left. It simply shades the color of the time past. But it, that doesn't tell me where I am with regard to project progress. It's simply a coloring chart. And without having a method of measurement and without being able to calculate the performance, not even performance, but the percentage complete against each item of work that you can. I think Mark's broadband might have frozen. It happens to all of us. So just uh, on that. Did he just, just uh, I'm going to just watch. I want to get, get through the question, guys. I think we could probably conclude in earn value that it's slightly aspirational. And in reality, you probably need a whole range of other metrics, certainly critical path, milestone completion. There's a whole range of other factors that are probably in the, in the gamut of project controls. So we haven't come, maybe if the panel, if, sorry, if any in the audience would like to ask a question around maturity, because I think that's so important to the topic. So if anyone has a question on that, but I want to keep honest to our panel and just to keep an eye on the questions here. So in terms of the, uh, I'm just going to look, uh, so just guys, you can try and keep a question. Uh, oh, we've loads of questions coming in now. Great. Okay. So here's an interesting one. And I know a lot of people 
on this call are from a civil engineering, uh, from a construction background. And in fairness, that probably is the home of project controls. But I think that's going to change in years to come. Here's a great question from Helen, uh, who works in IT. Uh, so Helen actually was on our, on our panel two weeks ago on the SRO. So the question here from, from uh, Helen is, it's very usual to hear about project controls in the context of construction and infrastructure projects. What do you think it think is the application in, in for IT industries, for in technology? So IT. So in fairness, uh, I personally haven't heard the term in, in IT projects where we use project controls. Um, but certainly there's, there's plenty of money being spent there and there's schedules to be delivered, etc. But in mm. terms of uh, any of you in terms of technology projects where you've seen uh, an emphasis on project controls? All I would say is my wife works for a software development company and she, she I suppose, appreciates what I do in my career and she would constantly, uh, I suppose, um, let me know that it's lacking in her company from a, a project controls point of view that they really need to bring some of the processes on board that, you know, they're, they're selling software, but there's no functional requirements. There's, there are employers, there's just no detail set out in the first place. And then there's no tracking or management. And she said, ultimately, they end up overspending on the project. So look, at, I, I don't work for an IT company, but I can't see why it wouldn't be applicable. At the end of the day, an IT project is a project. It has, you know, a start, a, be a beginning and a, an end. And there's, um, um, there's hours associated with, and there's, you know, material associated with it. So I don't understand why you wouldn't. Yeah, I suppose just the slight thing might be, uh, uh, which I would, so I can understand it from your point of view, but I, I could understand maybe somebody like Helen, who's working in Agile. So when you talk about project controls in an Agile adaptive, that sounds like a far more complex uh, animal where, where they probably don't have a full WBS built down. So scope is obviously evolving as the project progresses. So I think that's, that, that's certainly a bigger challenge, um, but there is project controls. Any, let's be honest, any review meeting of a project is a project controls exercise. Mm. So it's certainly happening, but I think it's probably back to that maturity curve. It's probably um, lower down the maturity curve in, in, in traditional IT projects as opposed to traditional sort of civil engineering projects, et cetera. Just gonna keep going with the questions, guys. So again, to, to the audience, please, please, uh, Comments are great, but we need a question at the end of them. So just uh, going back, not trying to leave anything out here. So Paul has, Paul Daly made the comment, which is followed by a question. Uh, he's not in a PM role that long, but he, he's asking the question, is there a clarity on roles and responsibilities in terms of project controls versus PM? And I think the panel have answered that, that maybe in larger scale projects, there isn't so. Uh, and also if they're part of the project scope or a client's willing to pay for it, but if it isn't, there probably is where a project manager is acting in two roles. We could understand that there probably is certainly um, an overlapping when you've one individual doing both roles. Mm -hmm. I think the comment was made as very valuable that it's an investment. It's part of good planning and that the idea of having a PM and a project controls person who can bounce ideas off each other is probably a great investment in any project. Um, clients pay a lot more on on variations and overruns perhaps than the cost of a good project controls function in the longer run. Okay, so let me keep going here with the, with the questions. Um, so here's a question uh, from David. Are any of the panel, uh, so any of the panel, any experience or instance where the PM constantly ignored? Oh my goodness, this is gonna be like a, a Dear John letter. Let's see here. <laughs> so any of the panel ever experienced an instance where the PM constantly ignored or overrided input from a project controls officer where PM was fixated on just one aspect, no matter what schedule delivering on time or cost. So look, that's, that sounds like a project, a bit of conflict within project team between uh, PM and project controls. Uh, I, I, I'm sure it happens on, on all project teams there's conflict. And in fact, we all know in, in the PM space, conflict is healthy. But I suppose what they're looking at there, have we come across where they're poles apart, where the PM thinks X and the controls think Y? Have you come across that where there's almost no, they're more adversarial than collaborative? Yep. Yes, I have, unfortunately. Um, right. And it, it came down to, uh, the there was a project in the Netherlands 
and uh, the PM was constantly buying out all of the packages over budget and wouldn't listen to the fact that if you continue to do this, you will run out of money very quickly. And he thought he knew best and ultimately that he would save and recover the money in other ways. It's a very simple thing. If everything you buy is over budget, you're going to blow the budget very, very quickly. And he thought he knew best. And in the end, he wouldn't listen to anybody. And uh, the project did go over budget and significantly just by thinking he knew best and ignored advice. Now, that's just that's an isolated incident, I have to say. Um, but it does happen. OK, OK. So I think that that really comes back, I would imagine, to that maturity uh, issue as well. It reminds me one time uh, 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 a scheduler explained to me that the job of the of the project controls people is to remind the project manager that no matter how many women are involved, you still can't deliver the baby any earlier than nine months. So that was how they described the concept of, of a project controls and PM relationship. Uh, but I think it's it's definitely a maturity uh, uh, or lack of it, perhaps, or maybe just experience. Uh, we all know we learn as much from our mistakes as we do what works well in projects. It's okay. John, John, yeah. Tony Marr here. Jump in, sure, Tommy, yeah. Tony, um, I, 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 t I think in, in, in answer to the, the question about conflicts between project managers and project controls, I mean, Traditional project management, project controls is a subset of the project management. And really it's, it's up to the project manager to decide what level of controls he wants. The conflict where project controls are told are basically ignored, it just reflects on the project manager. The project manager doesn't know what he's doing. Yeah, I think that that's probably fair, but, but the only point I would make, and again, it's just an observation, we are seeing like there are people on 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 the panel who are head of project control. So that those organizations have made a deliberate decision that they probably need a head of project management and they need a head of project controls in the same way. Maybe an organization might decide they need a quality control department and they need a quality assurance department or the idea of the solicitor or the barrister. So I think that's a traditional view. Certainly, when you look at it in terms of take the example where the birth of this modern emphasis on project controls comes from that new role that's developed in the last five to 10 years, that of a project analyst. And looking at it from the outside, I think what has happened is organizations thought they could just have a project analyst to support the PM and are realizing with the level of spend and complexity, you need an actual function within or a department within the organization. So I think that's the traditional view but it's obviously changing because there are project controls functions now that are, do not necessarily sit under project management within organizations. So yes, traditionally, but I think that's changing to be honest with you. Yeah, well, I, I still think I, it's probably back to a, a matrix um, structure for projects or else um, a project uh, set setup. Yeah. And, and traditionally the project set setup is where the, the, the roles are clearly defined that, you know, for a project, you have a project manager and you have, now the, when you're talking about departmental within companies, that's a different ball game. But I, I still think that, you know, a, a project is ultimately a project, a once off endeavor. Yeah, okay, okay, yeah, so the- and, and for every project you need, you know, uh, you know some sort of structure. And, and the issue I'm seeing and it's, it's really rampant now, is that project managers don't know anything about project controls. They're engineers, they're, they're designers, I should rephrase that, because a lot of project managers are engineers, qualified engineers, but they're designers. I'm working on a job that's two billion, and the project director and project manager knows nothing about time or money. Well, we, we better. We, I'm going to do you a favor and I'm going to move on because you could. Yeah. I, I suspect you might make 110 enemies on this call in the next minute if you keep going with the. But I do, I do accept they are complementary uh, and different. But I do think that like PMs understand, like, you know, I, I think that's slightly general because PMs are running project controls all the time and project controls people typically have experience in PM. So I suppose. To, to try and always put a positive hat on it, I think we need to look at them as complementary and that 
both need to respect that they probably have stronger disciplines in each, but there's certainly a room for both of them. I'm just going to keep going with the questions, if that's okay, guys. So interesting one here uh, coming from Cormac Amini. So Cormac, uh, so a question coming here, guys. It's around quality in project controls. I just had a quick pre-read. So the, the controls considered tonight tend to be cost, program, risk, and Mark mentioned scope. But what about quality, which is central in the old PM triangle? How do the panel see that quality should be controlled and by who? Often pushed to a contractor in construction. So the whole area of managing quality in project controls. Mm. Yeah, I, I might just come in there. I have a, have a couple of comments on this. Uh, I, I know Karma quite well. Uh, I know his organization, organization that he works for well. Um, look, I think BCAR, uh, in terms of construction, has been a very, uh, very good initiative over the last couple of years. It's put more of a focus on quality, um, certainly in terms of um, independent certification. But I think in, in, in the last recent year or two, certainly in certainly commercial and residential construction, I think the, the, the role of quality control and quality assurance on projects is much more to the fore, as it should be. Um, I think it's got lost somewhat between the design team, the project manager and the main contractor. Everyone gets a little bit siloed in what they're supposed to um, do in terms of their scope of works. And ultimately, the, the client is probably losing out on a lot of projects in terms of um, not receiving a, a really top level quality project. So uh, I think Cormac is right. I think quality control and quality management um is, is fast becoming a separate discipline within the design team, as it should be. Um, and I think it'll be only for the benefit of projects. And, and it does fit somewhere within project controls. It is, it is quite an emerging um, area, but it's one that the industry needs. Um, and I, I certainly fully back it in terms of its development. Yeah. OK, so just just uh, uh, looking at keep keeping going with the question. So uh, Pat has made the comment quite similar to, to what Helen uh, uh, stated earlier. So Pat just made the point that it seems to be very construction orientated, where there's a fear of cost over on claims as a driving force. So just on that, absolutely. When we went out looking for a panel, it was all construction engineering people we got and the panel next week, which is on agile it's all IT people. So in the same way, you'll find it hard to get construction people to talk about the adoption of Agile, you'll find it hard to get IT people to talk about the adoption of project controls. So I think some of these things are a little bit more, in, they sit slightly better with industries, but certainly I think if we're having this conversation in five years time, we will have people from IT. And I, I do know we had some one person from IT, Roy, who commented earlier, he offered to come on the, the panel. Um, but from an IT infrastructure point of view, I think the project controls is certainly maybe software development. It might be a little bit different. Um, so, uh, OK, we'll keep going. So uh, uh, great. Uh, so here's Joe. Joe is uh, Joe. Uh, hello, if you're there. I know you run a, a great podcast and a channel in the US. I just sent you a message earlier. So uh, Joe's question here, uh, when leading US government defense contracts for Bell Helicopter, we were required to utilize earned value. The government audited us regularly and went out of compliance funding, we would uh, go to escrow. So they use Primavera for that. So th that's OK. But to be honest, Joe, I think in the US you have a, a contractual requirement to use earned value management. And probably you guys are ahead of us in the US because it's a contractual uh, requirement. Uh, so it typically isn't required in government contracts here. So that possibly is where, where, you, where you've come across that in that space. OK. Um, uh, let me see. OK, so uh, oh, here's an interesting one. So this is sitting uh, outside of the construction, uh, which is great to see. So uh, so question from Roy, where does benefits management fit with project controls? Now that's a that's a tough question, by the way. So anyone dare to take that? So benefits management. The holy grail of successful project delivery that not only you deliver on time, on budget, to scope, but there are benefits in what you deliver. So much harder to measure, perhaps, and therefore much harder to measure from a controls point of view. Um, <clears throat> look, from a DA point of view, um, uh, the DA, the client side of the organization, we obviously are, we're all DA, but the, the end user side of the organization, if you want to call them, be that a runway or a taxiway or an extension to a terminal, they will develop a benefits realization plan. I suppose from our point, we, we, we 
our role there is, I suppose, to assist in development of the schedule at a high level. So this would be all prior to feasibility, be very all early on in the process and develop some high level, um, I suppose, numbers around our plan and I suppose a, a risk register of sorts to, I suppose, to highlight what issues could be coming down the line. But from our end in the DA, we, we, we're, we're involved when it comes to benefits realization, but uh, it would be in a supporting role. Okay. Okay. Great. Uh, I think John, just just in terms of, uh, I suppose, from a from a core perspective, you know, we obviously support in multiple industries, and where we see, you know, benefits realization um, really come into the fore is probably in those pharmaceutical, the life science, uh, healthcare type sectors, which is, you know, quite often pulls apart from from the engineering side, and very much the uh, benefits management, the benefit realization would be part of the PMO. Uh, responsibility for for oversight and then it'd be a pro a project management function to actually deliver uh, the nuts and bolts of, of that benefits program um so so I, i'd say as, as it currently stands probably sits outside the the, the controls sphere as it stands okay okay yeah that, that's yeah i think again and i think that's something maybe we've just forgotten about that there is there is a PM, there's a project manager and there might be a project controls professional. There is also a PMO that is supporting both and both of those are supporting the PMO as well. So we're not, we're not suggesting that the PMO becomes less relevant, I suppose. But what we're suggesting is that there's a, a new holy trinity between PMO, PM and project controls in terms of delivering successful outcomes. Okay, I, I, I almost feel that this is, a, this is a, a planned question from myself, so full disclosure it's not, but I will ask the question. So they, could, could the panel recommend a project controls course? So to be honest, part of this has arisen from on the MSc, I want to develop an, a, a module. Don't worry, the, the students on it, you, you, uh, it, it'll take 12 months to go through QA, so you're safe. But I, I, I certainly think it's a massive issue in globally that there's no universal sort of standard like the PMP around project control. So certainly I would like to develop within our MSc program with the students who are there who will, and with our industry panel. But I, I don't think there is any sort of global certification and there tends to be an, obviously very little happening in terms of uh, education around project controls versus, um, versus project management. I do know, Paul. You have a you have a master class in it, so you can you can you can give us a, a shameless plug. on I know you guys have a master class in project controls coming up. So, what, what are you going to cover in that, or when's that on? Oh yeah, that's next week, and uh, yeah, just give going to give a, a bit of a flavour as to uh, you know from a, from a technology perspective how Cora you know the the, the software platform underpins uh, project controls. So. Um, John, I'm sure we can circulate some details about uh, okay. about that next week. It's on it's on the Cora website. Yeah, no problem. You can well you can drop it in the chat if you want. I just see Gabriella, who was on our panel from two weeks ago. Good to see you, Gabriella. Just uh, back from the, U the US. Uh, so feel to jump in, uh, question or comment as we go. So in terms of moving along, there's plenty of questions here. Paul is asking the question. Um, uh, maybe suggest change in adoption of alternatives is an issue in both industries. So I think that certainly most strategic complex pro projects are change management initiatives. Uh, so that's probably part of project controls equally at the moment. Uh, just looking here. So uh, we're coming back to the kind of the, the, the heavy uh, project controls of, of earned value. So the question here, how do people measure a percentage complete on the project if they don't use uh, earned value? Um, I think if you let people, they'll pluck it from the sky, but uh, perhaps the panel will give a, a more insightful answer than that. So if you're not using earned value, how are you tracking percentage complete? John, within the IT industry, uh, before you, uh, in fact, part of a statement of requirements, uh, you would ask the contractor to put together an implementation timetable showing costs, key stages, key payment points, uh, resource requirements, et cetera, et cetera. And then it's the monitoring of all of these 
uh, taking account of uh, testing and approval at different stages, which would monitor the progress of, of the project in an IT environment. Now, a lot of the, I think, I think what, wrong, what the problem here is that the terminology that I would use as an IT person is quite different from the terminology that was being used in the construction. But I think that uh, both are trying to achieve the same thing um, against a plan, monitoring progress, and uh, using what you would call controls to see if there's any slippage, what that slippage is, and try and get a resolution of those problems. So I think, I think a lot of the problem here is, is terminology between construction and IT. Yeah, it probably is. I think that that's probably, uh, certainly the, the terminology we're getting better understanding uh, in both camps. But ju just to come back to the concept of, of percentage complete, guys, in ter terms of, the panel, are, are you using percentage complete uh, and, we, and how successful is it? We, we do, John. We, we track percentage complete, but um, I would say one trick that I think a lot of project managers miss is to link um, the uh, contractor's cash flow and payment with program because generally speaking, it's the ultimate, um, it's the ultimate metric. If the contractor is not spending uh, the money that he should be spending on a monthly basis, and yet he's still claiming to be on program or ahead of program, it's unlikely to be the case. And a lot of project managers in terms of project controls don't actually link cost and program in that most simplistic of ways. Yeah, I would, I would, I would agree very, very strongly with that from the IT side of things, because uh, in the IT side of things, again, if you don't see the money being spent, you know that there's a problem there somewhere. And um uh, in the IT side of things, it's, uh, the actual expenditure of money is usually very open and it's usually very uh, clear how the money's being spent. But it seems from what you're saying in the construction, everybody likes to keep their books hidden. <laughs> yeah. but, but, sense, is, but isn't it the, the, the whole thing of cash flow and spend, it really gives you that high level feel of, you know, we're spending money, so therefore we're moving forward at the end of the day. However, like with the three things that we would normally look at on projects for earn value, we have the plan value, the actual earn value that we have achieved to that point, and then the level of effort that it has taken us to get there. So by looking at those things, we can figure out where we are today and project forward of how we're going. If we don't have some sort of a metric or a way to calculate those then we really are only taking a subjective view of where we are today on the project. You have to have some way to actually calculate those and be able to project forward. Um, for example, even if there was a claim came in, you have no way of showing whether someone's productivity was good or bad without being measuring these values. And you, you have to do it. You, I got cut off earlier. I was saying about a schedule being like a coloring chart when the time bar moves from left to right. That has to be loaded. You can load it with manners. You don't need to load it with costs. But at least then you have an indication of the time it takes and the level of effort to do that. And then from there, you can plot your rest curves, do your calculations and everything else. Okay, yeah. So it's, it's uh, yeah, I think, I think you're highlighting on the, the, the complexity and the challenges uh, with doing that, it's I do. Not easy, but it, it's it's benefit that you get out of it is is, is really really worth it. Okay, yeah. great. Okay, John, just, if yeah. if you if I can jump in. Sorry, Gabriella, jump in, sure. Yeah, thank you for for taking me, and I I had too many things to do today, <laughs> but um, you need yeah, to I, I think Gabriella. Yes, <laughs> we we use the we use a lot of earn value. I actually teach it. I used to teach it at. Georgia. At Washington University and we use it as a control and what we try to do for companies in whatever field they are and we did construction engineering operation and IT when we go what we call the maturity level so if they want to try some control they really need to have some kind of register of their activities and they need to be able to establish an estimate the time frame that's required as well as a number of resources that they're going to use for this it absolutely, like, I think like Pat and Mark just said, it has to absolutely be connected somehow to your budget. There is no way if you don't have the cost of the money spent, you know, both from the contractor or the internal staff and, and your budget, there is no way you can do that. But 
the problem, and, and I think Mark just mentioned it, even when you have a good um, earned value process, determining the percent complete has to be agreed to with everybody. Do we do it from zero to 1% when it's um, completely? Do we do as we go? Uh, one way that we found both in IT actually is to list a series of activities that had to be performed, for example, in a work package of two weeks. And if yeah. we have this work package of two weeks, we have 10 activities. If we completed two, three, or you know whatever number, that gives us at least some kind of indication to move on and see that we're doing this. And we usually do it a lot now with the Agile project where people are not very familiar with earned value, but they can at least figure out what they can do in two weeks. And if that's too much, then we go down to a week and then we list the activities. This is really important. And then we monitor the reality. They say, well, you know, I thought I'm gonna do those 10 activities, but they ended up doing five. So we readjust that. It's, it's a really long process to figure out what is the proper control and then to get everybody to agree, you know, either activities or, you know, is it 50% or whatever is a percentage, it's really hard because I don't know about you guys, but my experience in IT is a lot of people say, well, you know, we're almost done. I think we're there. <laughs> we're probably gonna have almost, oh, I'll be there next week. Yes, in what year? <laughs> so it's amazing how quickly you get to 80% complete. Yes. <laughs> how long that? How long that twenty percent takes? Absolutely. Exactly. <laughs> and I'm sure why why the question was asked about percentage complete for that very reason. We've all seen it get to 80, 90, 99, but never hundred. So it. Uh, yes. And, and a lot of this too, thing, as complex it sounds, make... sounds. Sorry, go ahead, Gabriella. Go ahead. Sorry, sorry, John. I said that just just to end up this this fun conversation is. In, in my world, most of the people, you know, you ask them how much time you try to estimate the duration or the effort for any kind of activity. And the world can be built in three days. I am telling you, all those guys, they can do everything in three days. I'm like, and how much calendar day are we going to need to have those three days done? You know, it, it's really amazing. So those are the parameters. You really need to know, are we measuring effort? Now, how much calendar day does that look like, you know, when you have this person available? So you think about availability. And then you need to know how many activities per se are going to be done and how many people are going to do it. So those are the control that you need to put in place. And you need to be able to have people interpret the earned value the right way. So, <laughs> That's uh, another subject. <laughs> kind of listening to a lot of that, there's a lot of discussion about, about uh, you know, in terms of what's required. But, the, but it sounds to me that the PMO has a governance function in, in doing that. And... The, the other thing I, I found in my own role is that w we don't put in the adequate time into planning. A lot of things you talk about take time and it's back to the fundamentals of good planning. Uh, I mean, so many times we see projects uh, going straight to execution and they're planning as they execute. And certainly you may be able to do that in an agile adaptive, but certainly in a, in a traditional uh, project, uh, I think it's time and time again, we've seen project disaster one after the other. Just kind of keep an eye on that. The question on maturity has come up, so I might just take that, but please, you can jump in. I see uh, Mark has put in a good resource for project control ma materials. Somebody asked me a question about a book, so I'm sure that's a good place to start on. And I see, Paul, you've dropped in your uh, project controls class, which I'm sure we're all welcome to attend. So let me come back to the question in terms of maturity. So what do the panel think are the biggest hurdles to ach achieving the required organizational maturity to properly roll out project controls on major projects or capital projects. Anyone? So how do you get the maturity in your organization where you can harness project controls? to, the, to I the think right? John from the IT side of thing is uh, a disbelief that uh, project controls have any role to play, to be honest. Mm. Uh, uh, the uh, you know, project controls as being earned value uh, is something that uh, from, a, from an IT side of thing, uh, certainly from a client's point of view, uh, doesn't come on the horizon at all. Uh, on the uh, provider side of things, on the contractor side of things, uh, the earned value there uh, does not play a key role in that um, their target is to meet key stages to deliver key project deliverables. 
okay. uh, and be paid for those key project deliverables, not to constantly monitor earned value. So the whole concept of controls and earned value is something that's yeah, very, can, very I, loose in IT. Yeah, sorry, sure. John, can I pop in there? I'm sorry, I'm actually the person who asked the question. Um, Go for it. May, maybe I, I worded just a bit, I worded it a bit poorly there. Just before um, you say that, Michael, like just... Uh, I don't know if you did. Your question was around maturity, so so just by all means go on. But 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 just uh, your question was great actually. But but feel free to ask it in whatever way you want. Well, so I, well, so I suppose the word, word it's slightly different. I've visited three multi-billion euro projects uh, in the last month, and the one thing that came across to me is that there is a rebranding of of what project controls is. Oh, sorry, they've rebranded the planning team as project controls and they don't fully understand what the full scope of the team is. And that's really what I was kind of getting at in, in the question. Um, the functions of the project control team are more than just say earn value. You know, we've got risk and change management and, and that's what, a, you know, just form part of, of the function, not just planning and, and kind of rebranding what they do and calling it project controls. Um, that's really it, you know, with, with that in mind, that was really the question at the panel is what I meant to ask of, what do they think are the biggest hurdles to that need to be overcome? But are you saying in, in that organizational context, just maybe I picked it up wrong, but the actual that the planning, the planning of the project is deemed to be a project controls function and the execution of the project is a is the project management. Did I misinterpret that? Um no, not really. Well, what I've found is that um the three projects that I was talking to to say that they were doing project controls was actually they have just rebranded planning, uh, the planning team as a project controls team to say that function was met. Uh, um, can... They are a project controls team that didn't even realize that what risk management was or or how change control was properly uh, enacted. But, okay. but if I can, just by changing the name and rebranding, scheduling is just a subset of what project controls does. Um, it, it's very unusual at times to find someone that's fully rounded in all of those areas. And it takes a long time and a lot of war wounds to get there, to be very honest, to have all of that skill. But project controls is not just scheduling. It's not just cost. Uh, it's the combined skills of all of those activities to come in under the one umbrella of project controls. Um, so you can't really have one without the other. Again, it goes back to the name. It's controls, it's around controls on the project itself. So that control is on both cost, schedule, scope, and risk. Uh, you can't just simply say we've ticked, or shouldn't, I should say, and you can do what you want, but you can't, you shouldn't just take a box and say, I have project controls now, so therefore I'm compliant and I've mitigated any risk that's there. Clearly that's not true. And to, to, for people really to take project controls on board, they just need to understand more about what project controls is um, and the benefits that it can bring. It's a huge, I've, do, I've been doing project controls, I've been in construction 32 years and um, they can bring a lot, a true project controls professional can really bring a lot of value to a project and help the project manager no end to navigate some of the hurdles that you'll come or face during project execution. Okay, okay, I think, okay. Anyone else in the panel like to jump in and add to that? Well, uh, Philo Hagen here from Linesight. Um, I just want to uh, say um, it's unusual to hear everybody talking about project controls as if it's not, sort of, as if it's in its infancy, which maybe it is, but um, I work for three large pharma uh, companies and they all actually have a well-established project controls team themselves. So they want you to be impartial. They want you to challenge the client. They want you to challenge the project manager. They want you to challenge construction. And then every month on the owner's cost, which is not construction, uh, they allow us or they expect us to hold uh, meetings with each of those owners, which could be IT, automation, CQB, and sort of challenge them as to Know, are you really going to spend this money? You said you're going to spend this money for six months. You haven't, or we take it away. So this, they, they allow us to be impartial, which makes project controls quite a sort of a standalone department, if you like. 
So that's how it's independent it's, from project management, Sheila. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it, so, would it be fair to yeah. say that you're almost like an audit function under project management, yes. or is that too yes. strong? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we would okay. do everything as well from, you know, procure to pay. We might say, okay, so you've got 400 million to spend. We'll cut all the peels for you. We'll pay all the bills for you. Uh, we'll report it. We'll report underspends, overspends. So, or maybe something like FX that nobody's even looking at. So um, they, they, yes, that's probably a fair comment that we're like independent auditors. Okay. So, so to, to let me push that a step further. Would it be fair to say then that the project management function is is reporting into you for permission to spend? They okay, they're not reporting in, but they do check. They do constantly check with us. Okay, I want to spend X amount on on hiring five more CQB people. Can I do so? so okay, so, you know. Okay, great. So I, I'm going to put this back to the panel. The only reason I made that comment, guys, is what we heard earlier, which is it's a traditional way we heard about that project controls is a subset of project management. That's the traditional view. But what we've just heard from, uh, 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 sorry, I forgot your first name there. Sheila. Sheila. Sheila yes, we spoke earlier. Uh, good, to, good to talk to you, Sheila. In terms of what Sheila proposes that the project controls is coming up to sit at the same level or maybe even slightly in terms of an audit function. So that certainly turns a traditional view of project controls on its head that it sits under project management yeah which it yeah. certainly isn't there. And from speaking, from listening to the to the panelists, it sounds that they it has a, an equal or complementary role to PM within the, where, where people are taking on a head of project controls function. But over to the panel, any thoughts on that or any comments on Sheila's interpretation? Yeah, look, at, um, I, I suppose we would align somewhat with where Sheila is in that um, we um, have processes in place that a PM cannot go out and spend what they like on a project like Mark explained earlier in, uh, in, 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 in Netherlands. There are processes there that are set up by project controls and that project controls, I suppose, review and make sure that there is no overspend. You stay within your budget. This is your allowance for package Y, X and Z. So yeah. those processes are in place. But I think from our point, we then work under the project manager in that, you know, the project manager knows the advice needs to be, or the, the, the process need to be adhered to. We also give advice then, I suppose, as to, you know, what we think from a cost perspective. We also manage their schedules for them from a time perspective. We facilitate risk, risk workshops. So we, we do more, but we do ultimately, apart from the fact that we do have that functional uh, matrix, the broken line out to myself, we do work for the PM, but that we make sure processes are adhered to. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Anyone else in the panel want to jump in? Uh, John, yeah, I, I'd like to share an ex uh, what, what we didn't we were talking about maturity before. When I work for the Center for Medicare and Medicaid, it, it's a huge system. You know, in the U.S., it's 335 million users. It, it's it's absolutely huge. But the IT um, area that we were working in was CMM level five. So all the projects were had to evolve. In, in, as a matter of metrics and measurements with the CMM level in IT. And then we also added to that the lean and you know, now the agile uh, approach. So we looked at it in a different way. We look at the ecosystem that those projects or you know, applications were working in. And then we looked at the measurements and the process that we use for each one of those area. But there's very few companies or department or CMM level five. But I know in IT, it, the, the combination of that and the project management standards kind of helped us figure out what were the best standards and the measurement. And you're right, it's not just the core processes. It's, it's everything that you do. It's measuring the, the application that you use or the process that, and the methodology that is used on that, including audits and all kinds of things. So the more sophisticated you are in, in looking at the whole process from the top perspective, then the more sophisticated tools you have. But if you want to start from the bottom, you start to at least, you have to measure something and have to be able to compare to your baseline. You know, if there was one thing that we can do to put project control or program control or portfolio control is we have to start working with a baseline. We have to compare it with something, you know, and then move on from with the standards of the industry that we worked in. So. Okay, so it's very good. So I'm just watching. Speaking of project controls, I need to watch my own schedule and time. So I'm going to, there is one question in the panel, and then there's a couple of really short questions I want to ask. 
in, in terms of uh, this question popped up here. Uh, uh, so, so Ken, Kenneth uh, Kilbert, he asked the question. I'll just give a, uh, I think it was two questions there. There's a question about mega projects. I'll paraphrase that one because I've just read it. So there's a question there from C. Lee. 77% uh, of the world's current construction mega projects are greater than 40% 40, 40 behind uh, program. So that's a kind of, there's quite a long paragraph as you can see there. But in terms of, I think the question is asking, why is that? And in terms of, of mega projects, my own thought is mega projects are a totally different animal. Uh, and if you actually did the real baseline, none of these projects would ever get to go ahead. And they typically have a lot of political interference. And I'm not too sure if politicians and project managers and QSs and schedulers uh, mix as well as they should. So that would be my own thought. But anyone on the panel like to make a quick comment on that in terms of mega projects? And what's interesting in the Irish context, we are now in the world of true mega projects where we have projects that are costing in excess of a billion uh, euros, which we didn't have up to certainly five or 10 years ago in this country. Is the emphasis not on getting the contract by any means possible and then worrying about how you're going to actually fulfill it within the, uh, within the scope and the cost that, that you've agreed? Yeah, I think this is a particularly a question around uh, infrastructure mega project. So definition of mega project, a project that costs in excess of a billion euros and it has impacts on a million people or more. So typically it's civil infrastructure. Anyone on the panel want to jump in and take that? Any thoughts on it? I think that uh, I think uh, sometimes sponsors or people who, you know, people who, I suppose, come up with the idea of a project in the first place and then they push for an estimate. I've seen too many times where single point estimates are being forced upon um, QSs and projects then lead with that single point estimate where they go, right, it's going to cost 1.1 billion depending on where you are in the project and what stage you're at, you need to have bandwidth. You need to have plus or minus 30, 40, 50%. And nobody ever wants to go and say it's going to cost between 750 million and 1 billion, 250, one and a quarter billion. So I think we feel there sometimes. Yeah, the, the example I always refer to is the Olympics. Every Olympic Games costs in excess of twice what was planned. Yeah. And we all know it's going to do that. But if we agreed to that at the beginning, no country would tender for the Olympics, which... So, so we, we fake it uh, until it's approved and then we deal with it after. So that's probably part of the reason. The question, think, oh, this yeah. is always the way, the questions fly in at the end. So let me, let me try and uh, paraphrase here. Uh, some new uh, collaborative contractual relationships such as target costs uh, due to panel. So I think that I just, again, the question here is around new collaborative contracts and ways of working. I had this conversation with some of the panel uh, in prior chats, anyone like to jump in in terms of more collaborative ways of working our contracts? IT wouldn't work without uh, collaboration as the basis of the arrangements. Okay. Okay. Uh, anyone else want, want to? Yeah. Make well, but what I will say about collaborative contracts and, and contract mechanisms, John, um, I suppose some of the some of the most successful projects I've been on have been uh, run and managed and delivered in a fairly collaborative manner. Uh, but I will say there's always a trade-off. Um, there, there's no perfect panacea. Uh, and whereas you might achieve program and PC dates, uh, your budget might may well be blown uh, and you may achieve good quality. But I've, I've rarely come across projects where you know you achieve the, the good old um, uh, golden triangle um, of everything working great. Okay. Uh, I might, oh, sorry, Sheila. Yeah, jump in. I think, I think the floor is yours, Alan, if you want to. Oh, okay. I might add, look, at, we um, have uh, adapted the approach of using NEC contracts and look, at we're, we're, we're treading softly, so we're using option A, which is, I suppose, still a lump sum, so we're not really gone down the collaborative road yet, but we are starting to go for the target cost and look at that. There are real benefits to it, but all I would say is that it is admin heavy, so there is a trade-off. There's a lot of work to ensure that you're constantly dealing with uh, compensation events, et cetera, as they arise, so that you're not looking at, I suppose, that argument at the end or that trade-off or that horse deal at the end, but they are admin heavy. So you do need the staff to deal with that and the, the tools such as the CMAR or whatever you're going to use to administer your contracts. Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna wrap up in five minutes, guys. I know we've gone over time. Charlie, you've asked a question there about sustainability and project management. That probably is a topic for another evening. Uh, I think it would be a very interesting one to try and answer it in the context of project controls. We probably wouldn't do it justice. 
just to ask the, the, the panel, and we'll try and give really short answers to this. In terms of the COVID, are you seeing a lot more changes, a lot more kind of claims are coming in in terms of that? And how are you managing those in terms of COVID has caused schedule, uh, had a schedule impact and it certainly probably created more cost implications. In a nutshell, how are you managing that or is that impacting on project controls? Yeah. I won't go there on the DA anyway. Okay. Uh, it, has, it has impacted projects with extension of time um, claims or, or costs coming in due to uh, social distancing and other issues that are there. So yes, absolutely. It has increased project, pro project costs to date. Um, uh, and I've seen it in both the US and in Europe that th there's costs come in for that. Okay, okay. So they're, 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 they, are, they are in fairness to the probably legitimate cost. It's, a, it's an unknown unknown in the PMs. Yeah, it, it's, it's something that has just arisen and come, it's come on everyone. And like, to be fair to the contractors and everybody else and engineers and staff is that this event has, has brought a lot of changes and it's affected the productivity, but it's also had people, if you have an international project to undergo somewhere in Europe, a lot of the workers, if you were working in Switzerland, a lot of workers could come from Germany, they could come from France, and with travel restrictions, some of the sites were shut down. So now they're starting to open back up and then there's costs and claims associated with all of that. And you just have to work through them to make sure they're fair and reasonable. Okay, and a slightly future focused question. We're hearing a lot of discussion about artificial intelligence and, and robotic process automation coming into pro, uh, project controls, coming into technology. Is, is it actually happening or is it still uh, somewhat aspirational? Is there any evidence where you're seeing AI being used in project controls at the moment? I think it's probably for me aspirational but it's as only as good as the information you put in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree. I mean, you know, again, really from, from the technology side, which, which, which I speak, um, I think having, you know, the first, the first sort of building block is having that sort of common data environment and having the information available there. Uh, the next part is really playing in, you know, the, the AI and, uh, and, uh, and, and the remote learning, because you know, again, what we want to be able to do going forward is to is to understand based on past performance, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that 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 future performance is you know is is going to be impacted by that. Um, we're, we're not fully there yet, but uh, but certainly uh, we're, we're we're moving in the right direction. Okay, yeah. John, I I'm working with two uh, university, one in Canada, which is McGill, and one here in Michigan. And they're both trying to develop a tool to help decision making in portfolio management. So we're trying to help them figure out, you know, what what are the dashboard and what do we need to have. The problem is like what uh, Mark and the other person just said before. It's really hard to know first of all what the people are looking for, and and to figure out a way to get the the process to make decision making because it, it's like statistically, you know, it's statistic and probability. So they need a lot of data to be able to do that kind of stuff. And unfortunately, we don't have a lot of data that's accumulated or you know, uh, that you can use that are really uh, accurate or usable for what we are trying to do. So I think it, it's something we will see probably yeah. in the near future, but it is kind of hard. You know, we, we just have like the first baby step of whatever could be used as a decision-making support process. Yeah, okay, mm -hmm. anyone else in that? My, my own thought in it is don't worry about the AI, just get reduce the number of spreadsheets and that's a good start in, 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 in you know, don't be giving me that nonsense. It's a, uh, you know, to, I've seen hundreds of spreadsheets on a single project and somebody cut copying, pasting multiple rows. So I, I think that's the utopian view. We would all just be happy to, to have a tool to report at the project, the program, the portfolio level. If we have to do some work, that doesn't bother us. So I think, you know, it's probably 10 years away uh, where we see this stuff happening, but certainly it will come down the road. Um, final question, earned value management was mentioned, will take critical path as a given, critical path with resources defined or critical chain as it's sometimes called, we'll assume you're using that, risk registers. What are the other tools or that you're using in project controls? 
beyond what we've mentioned, critical pass, earned value management, risk registers? What, what is think, the other secret sauce out there? I think, John, in terms of measuring productivity, getting resource uh, loaded programs from contractors is very important. Uh, and and it's, it's often hard to get. And it makes the PM's job harder to try and assess productivity if you can't even get a resource loaded um, program from a contractor. So that's, that's, that's one thing I'd say. Yeah, again, that's, uh, and I think that's, again, that's, a, that you have a realistic expectation. Again, AI is slightly, um, again, in that aspirational spa space when you're just happy to get a resource driven. <laughs> Keep it simple. Uh, John, John, did you mention money in your list there? Well, I think the earned value cost would be kind of a given. That would be. So I think we're, we, know, we know cost is a heavy focus. Okay, cost, right, sure. The critical path is a heavy focus. Yeah. Quality is being mentioned. But I was just interested to hear in terms of what are the other tools. So sometimes, you know, people at a strategy level in project management now sometimes talk about using the balanced scorecard, which is a very mm -hmm. typical yeah. strategy tool. So I'm just wondering, was there anything like that out there in the space of project controls where there are other tools that people find useful or techniques? Uh, I know in pharma, there's a big obsession on critical chain, which is resource driven mm -hmm. with baselines, et cetera. Yeah. I'm only seeing that come in in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just wondering, genuinely, just a genuine question is, is there anything else out there? Is there other, some other theory or tool or technique that we haven't heard of? That you're using? John, John, one, one yeah. very simple yeah. statement. Sorry, I think I cut yeah. across one. I was just going to say um, records, records of when things happen at the time that they happen. Everybody misses out on that. And when you've got it, you have to assess an extension of time claim or a delay in prolongation. If you don't have the records as a PM, you're in trouble. So just simple records of when things happen on site. Very important. And that's something I was going to say, if I may, yeah. is that one thing that has fallen out of favor is good keeping of minutes. Mm -hmm. Project minutes, they're invaluable. So it's back to the basics of everything. Have good document control, good project meeting minutes, and uh, all of those things. It's really, really, really important. But for what, for what is uh, another shameless plug here, JP, who's on my screen, is sitting next to you. He gave us a great presentation a couple of weeks ago on how to how to run an effective project meeting. So I would uh, we we might we might yeah. run that again. It was uh, I, yeah. I've seen it twice and I picked up something each time. So. Uh, Th th that's uh, for a small fee. I'm sure JP would be only too happy to talk. <laughs> no and problem. Think, uh, COVID uh, times. Yes. It. Okay. I think John, the, the last thing I would add to this one is use the baseline and have a properly documented and functional change control, integrated change control process that's well documented. Mm -hmm. That's also a good tool because, like you said, yeah, we have a baseline, but what helps you manage it is the change control process. It, it's not curved, you know, in stone. But you have to live with it and roll with it in a way. So those are two good tools to start with and use anytime. But documentation is absolutely necessary. And the good one, not too much, but what you need to know. Okay. Okay, so we're going to wrap up on that. I think listening to that, you're hearing a lot of the basics are still there. So I think when it comes to good data, and it's, it's that all important principle in project management, and God, we trust everyone else bring data to back it up. So that's certainly a principle of it. We're going to conclude this session next week we'll be looking at agile project management uh, so i'll put the link in the same way place you registered if you are sitting in interested in sitting on a panel on any topic you might send me uh, an email or a message via linkedin uh, we all the sessions are recorded we will share them with you in terms of the idea of project controls there's a massive amount of experience not just on the panel but on people who commented etc I'd really like you to uh, reach out to me and talk to me what you'd like to see on a module at a master's in project management. And we'll give credit to those people, obviously, who helped put, put it together. But other than that, thank you to the panel. Thank you to the audience. We leave it there and I'll let you get back to enjoying your evening. Thanks very much for your time, everyone. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.